Hey guys, it's Connor, and I'm back. How you doing? How's your mom? I miss your mom. Um, we're back after a brief little hiatus there for about three to four weeks where I was having some severe computer issues, but you know, not they're all fixed. That doesn't matter. Let's just move on, <laughs> okay? I'm here to crank out videos for you guys again, and I'm also here today to introduce a brand new segment called Up on My Soapbox, which is essentially my way of speaking about current gaming topics relative to whatever the discourse may be that week, right? And I wanted to do this because as of yesterday, December 8th, Jason Schreier released a very interesting article about Halo Infinite's dev cycle. If you're not familiar with Jason Schreier, he used to be of former Kotaku fame. He is now over at Bloomberg and is essentially the industry's last actual gaming journalist actually reporting on a lot of big stories right he broke the ubisoft uh stories from last year he broke this year's activision and blizzard stuff and now he's back to sort of shed some light on halo infinite's dev cycle but let me make this clear before we take another step forward because i can already you know hear the knives are sharpening and you know uh, all of y'all coming for my neck before you know I even get into what I'll actually be speaking about. Uh, I will not be talking about the actual game, right? I have not played the game in any regard, right? I didn't play any of the multiplayer, haven't played any of the campaign. I plan to at some point, right? Probably when I buy an Xbox. But this is not what this video is about. I'm not using this article as a weapon to bash Halo or say that the game is trash, right? I'll essentially be using this article and using 343 as a way to just break down and lead into my thoughts about current practices within the AAA market and how the bad implementations of most current trends, such as um, games as a service, microtransactions, and broken day one launches have sort of made me a bit cynical in, in a lot of regards and have increasingly been plaguing the industry at kind of an alarming rate. So let's just kind of, you know, get that out of the way. You know, don't come at me on Twitter. Don't come at me in the comments because honestly, I, I really don't care. But also, I'm not talking about the actual game, all right? So let's just get into to the article, which is titled, How Microsoft's Halo Infinite Went From Disaster to Triumph, right? So this article essentially just describes a AAA development hell that has become far too familiar for many modern gamers, right? In brief, 343's issues ran the gamut from everything imaginable when thinking about AAA development, right? I'll just hit on a couple of the main important ones, right? One of the first ones being internal tech issues stemming from un old Bungie code, which is from what I understand reading the article is kind of what happened with um, the Master Chief collection and and, and things like that. Staffing issues mainly dealing with employee retention from high up executives for those who kind of have been paying attention to Halo Infinite in general and sort of the story behind it. They did lose some producers and, and a creative director before Joseph Stanton came on and sort of saved this game, right? Along with just regular employees, right? The regular devs, which makes sense given Microsoft's stance on contractors in general. There was also a lot of mismanagement and commun communication issues, seemingly on every level, but mainly in the creative direction of the game during production, right? In the article, it's described that there was a lot of infighting going on at 343, where there was a lot of different sex kind of within the company, sort of vying for resources and, and having, you know, different ideas of what the game should be. I think the quote that kind of actually sort of makes that very clear and abundant within the article is uh jason interviewing one of the developers uh of halo infinite and basically asking them to describe the process of what it was like going on with all of these different you know sex and clicks within the company sort of um going one way or another with the direction of what the game should have been and he essentially describes it as uh, a process of four to five games being developed simultaneously, which is actually pretty crazy, um, but kind of makes sense given the next part of this article, which I'm going to read. I'm going to actually quote this part because I, I don't want to get anything wrong. So 
By the summer of 2019, Halo Infinite was in crisis mode. The studio decided to cut almost two-thirds of the entire planned game, leaving managers to instruct some designers to come to the office and do nothing while the studio figured out their next move. Oh boy. Uh, eventually, the game's open world was cut back from a vast Zelda-like experience into something far smaller. It soon became clear that to some on the team that even with the compromises, getting Halo Infinite into decent shape by the following fall would be impossible. Still, the timing of the release didn't seem up for discussion. Microsoft told 343 that it had to launch the game for the next Xbox, which meant releasing it in November of 2020, which obviously didn't happen, right? Because it's 2021 now. Um, and man, boy, where do I start? I think I'll start by saying that this news of Halo's development troubles isn't exactly shocking, and quite frankly, I think many people aren't going to care about this story, regardless of 343 literally breaking down in front of our eyes for the past couple of years, because the product that they have now released is doing exactly what a first-party AAA exclusive title should, and that is be received well, right? For the most part, it seems like the core gameplay um, from the campaign to the multiplayer is everything that hardcore Halo fans have wanted the franchise to be since 343 took over after Bungie, which is great to hear, right? You know, you've had devs uh, for the past five plus years pour everything into this game, and now, for the most part, everything is paying off like it should have. <sighs> All right, like, like, I, and you know what? You know what's great? And I'm going to ramble. This whole video is me rambling, so deal with it. If you stayed this long, whatever. If you didn't like it, you know what? Tune in the next week, bud, where I'm talking with a script and I'm a little more cheery. Uh, I just can't believe that this is still how the AAA business is doing it. That, you know, they don't listen to their team. Clearly, clearly they weren't listening to their teams, right? They didn't have any direction. Leadership was a mess. And, you know, they waited until very, basically the the uh the last minute to put something together worth anything like how are you as a business going to say that that way of doing things is successful and that that thing and that way of doing things works because it rarely works there are rare occurrences <laughs> where that works i mean even if it does work the first time like i said with examples of bioware or cd project red right it clearly doesn't work the second time cd project red you know with uh, cyberpunk in particular that story is notorious now of how much time they wasted in pre-production and that they basically waited until the last minute uh to to get it working on uh on consoles like it's just uh, it clearly it doesn't work right and with the cost of triple a development continuing to rise at such a rapid and large rate you would think that you would want to do what is best or at least emulate right what the the winning team so to speak is doing right you could say that sony you could say you know some of the other third party publishers right but no it's the same story over and over and over again and i think it's kind of a two way street where i do believe that it is the industry's fault for letting like standards of what games should be and how they should release are but it's also our fault as consumers for just being contempt with whatever they give us right and that kind of goes into like the service model of things and how live services and free to play and microtransactions and so on and so on, right like all these big huge keywords you use to describe sort of current gaming has sort of negatively impact game development in particular right I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not necessarily against games as a service, right? I'm not necessarily against that model, because I am a Destiny player, I'm not a super hardcore one, but, you know, I play it fairly regularly, right? I see their monetization, I see their battle pass, I see how they, you know, do their quote-unquote expansions, right? And to me, they are a company that does it right, for the most part, because you know they have dedicated themselves to essentially being a studio that is fully functional and and uh, uh uh and and committed to making sure that their service works whereas a lot of the other times it feels like these third-party publishers uh 
you know, such as EA, I'll use EA in particular, they just want the fastest route possible because they believe that the fan base, their player base are the dumbest people alive and that they'll just eat up any of the slop that they hand out. And Anthem was sort of the perfect example of the consumer base saying, no, you guys messed up. You need to fix this, right? Same with Battlefront 2 when that came out, when their uh, microtransaction sort of debacle came out. And to me, you, you know, using as EA as the example still, you think that they would have at least lessened or, you know, been a little bit more tempered when going into the next service, but it just seems like they didn't learn anything at all. And they just, they still think the same thing. And this is the problem when you have these suits in these higher up positions that know nothing about games or know nothing about gamers and just listen to the number guys saying, well, this is the analytics. This is the stats. See, if we, if we monetize it this way, we could possibly blah, blah, blah. Instead of like what the reality is, what most player bases are going to accept. And it's just so crazy to me. But we all know they're never going to learn. And like the point of this video is essentially just me complaining about it and just venting about it because I know this is never going to change. These, you know, business models have become staples at this point, right? They're never going to go away because I, you know, the hardcore audience can say what they want and they're like, well, I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to buy broken games. I'm not going to buy games as a service. I'm not going to buy any microtransactions, right? And they may be practicing what they preach, but, you know, we're not the majority, man. We are the minority when it comes to that, right? The casuals are the people who are what these companies are aiming for. And they're the people who essentially spend the money. Whereas, you know, us, whatever you could say, oh, we have more integrity or I don't even think it's necessarily that. It's just that we care about gaming way more than the average person. So when these things start affecting the way that we play our games and interact with our games that's when it becomes concerning to us but we have to remember and so and sort of like put it in the back of our mind that like yeah we're not the majority of the audience as much as we'd like to think we are which sucks because obviously it's starting to really temper a lot of expectations and, and change a lot of hardcore fans opinions on a lot of these companies right there used to be a time where you could trust on a big triple a game coming out and it being content complete and it not being broken right and not you, along with like oh not these companies trying to vie for every little dollar from your pocket that they can possibly get right and if I could fix one thing, right, out of all the things that I've complained about in the video, right, if I could fix one thing, right, I wouldn't change games to service, I wouldn't change the monetization, because on a business level, I do understand that, right, like I said, the, the, the cost of development at this point is so high that these developers do need to make their money back, uh, even after release, right, like, further than further than they normally have in the past where you just release the game you sell the game the, the, the game sells like a million or, or 10 million copies and then that's how you made all your money back but you know nowadays because of costs for marketing development staff how, uh you know so on and so forth right it's it's at such a high level that yeah a lot of these companies are going to start in, uh, incorporating microtransactions and battle passes and if uh in in their multiplayer components of the game not necessarily single player all the time right unless you're ubisoft but um if i could change one thing the one thing that i would change is just games not coming out broken on day one right if video games are these incredibly delicate houses of cards, right? Meaning that if you take one card out of uh, the entire structure, you know, there's some, bu you know, that's a representation of like bugs or glitches or, you know, uh, uh, so on and so forth, things of that nature, right? I would change that because nowadays you're not even getting a full uh, tower of cards. You're not even getting the full structure. You're getting half of the half of the cards, right? And then they're saying later down the line, oh, well, we, we can just patch it. We can just fix it. And that's like six months to a year down the line. I mean, look at Cyberpunk. That's exactly what happened where they released barely half a, a house of cards. 
and then just thought that oh that that half could sustain everybody until <laughs> we we patch everything in and I'm frankly I'm, I'm I'm kind of sick of it. I'm really sick of the way a lot of these AAA companies just in general whether it be these devs or the publishers it's mainly the publishers i have problems with like let's let's not get it twisted right they're the money men they're the suits right whereas the developers for the most part are trying to make the best game possible um they really need to start turning this ship right they really need to figure out that hey in the long run especially with our consumer base and our customers right especially with the hardcore audience who's always going to be there, right? The casuals are always going to leave at some point, you know, especially if you're a multiplayer game, your numbers are always going to drop. So you have to, at some point, cater to your hardcore audience. You need to make sure that those people are taken care of as well as the casuals, right? And lately, it feels like uh, as time just keeps progressing, the hardcore audience keeps getting pushed to the side and the side and the side. And it's being more open to the casual audience and more accepting to them and what they necessarily uh, need for their standards of games as opposed to the hardcore audience, which once again, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's at a certain point where it's just so unbalanced and so unfair for a lot of people. And I want those things to change. I want video games to be the absolute best medium that it can possibly be, given that I believe in it a lot more than TV, movies, books, things like that, because I truly do believe that video games are the best uh, entertainment medium and source of media that anyone can get their hands on, because it's just everything that you would want, right? But with that said, we're going to close this out. This was just a, 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 a venting video, a rambling video, so it was a little bit fun. It's not my best video, I know that. You know, thank you if you stayed all the way to the end. Um, I have two projects in the work for those who care. Um, next week is going to be a pretty good one, pretty back to normal, where it's very scripted, very edited. So until then, man, um, stay groovy and uh, have a good holiday.